Come Holy Spirit, may all who hear this gospel receive it and know themselves to be within it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, the joke is sometimes made that once the last bite of Thanksgiving has been eaten, once the last guest is dismissed, what happens next? Christmas! It's Christmas, right? In our culture, we like to go from celebration to celebration, from feast to feast. Waiting does not play well in our Insta culture. Our insta culture. But the scriptures and the wisdom of the church, they teach us differently. In the Bible itself, there is a rhythm in God's word itself of promise and fulfillment. God making a promise and then being faithful to that promise. Advent and Lent are these seasons of preparation, repentance, and renewal that reflect that rhythm in God's word itself. Advent, particularly, is the season of waiting. Not only, as I, as I told our kids earlier, not only for his first coming, we have the stations of the Nativity up, which tell that story, but more importantly, perhaps, for his second coming. Advent puts before us, as we heard in our readings, the call to watch and to wait with Christ. Let me put it like this. Let me summarize it like this. Advent awakens us to watch with Christ, reminding us that truly to truly rejoice in Christmas, we have to see Jesus as more than a baby in a manger. Amen? Advent waits for Jesus' return, and Christmas rejoices in the wonder of the Incarnation. That's the basic difference between the two. That's the wisdom of each season. And I would say there is no one better to wait with than Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah's book, you might know, has sometimes been called the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel because it so clearly sets forward Jesus Christ. It so clearly sets forward his his ministry and what God's going to do in Jesus. The amazing thing is, of course, that Isaiah wrote wrote hundreds of years. He wrote in the 8th century B.C. Hundreds of years before Christ. His prophecies are incredible because of their bold detail. Just think of Isaiah 53, right? That wonderful passage. The bold detail that we have there of the ministry and the mission of God's Messiah. Even more, I think about this. Isaiah wrote during a period of impending judgment. He wrote uh, under the threat of invasion. He wrote in a time when nothing seemed solid or firm. Does that sound familiar to you as you look across the landscape of our day? Sounds familiar to me. So, this Advent, we're going to be waiting with Isaiah, we're going to hear his message, and we're going to apply it in Christ. In chapter 2, let's go ahead and look at our passage now. In chapter 2, Isaiah receives the word of the Lord and he sees a vision. He receives the word of God and he sees a vision. He sees a time when the mountain of the house of the Lord will be what? What does it say in our text? Exceedingly exalted above all others, despite how it looks in his day. He sees the house of the Lord exalted and he sees all nations coming to it. I want to first focus focus us on uh, verse 2 and what it says. The latter days, seeing beyond the horizon. Look at verses 1 to 2. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. I want you to circle that phrase, in the latter days. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, this is what the New Testament calls the last days. These are the days that we're living in, friends. Paul, in our epistle reading, says the day is what? At hand. 
The night is far gone. Isaiah was looking forward past the horizon of what could have been seen even unto Jesus' death and resurrection. Ever since Jesus' death and resurrection, we have been living in the latter days seen by Isaiah. But for Isaiah, this would have been far beyond what could have humanly been seen or forecast. There was no way he could see past his own day into what God would would do. Think of it this way. It is about looking past what is humanly possible or what can be expected on a human level. Isaiah is seeing what God's going to do. What God's going to do. Even the way this passage uh, is interjected into Isaiah is in a way that's totally unexpected. Isaiah is actually in the midst of ridiculing God's people for their sin. In chapter 1, and then again in chapter 2. He's ridiculing them so much that he even calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. That's pretty bad, right? That's pretty bad. And yet he sees a time when the whole world will participate in blessings out of what? Out of Zion. Out of God's holy mountain. Here's what I would say in this whole seeing behind, beyond the horizon thing. In the latter days that Isaiah is seeing into. Isaiah is actually seeing the world from God's perspective. He is actually seeing God's perspective on history and the trajectory of history. One commentator says this, and I love this, Isaiah's book is a vision that reveals a God-centered way of seeing and living. It offers everyone the true alternative to the false appearances of this world. Oh my. Isn't that especially true during the Advent and Christmas season when our culture seems to go crazy for like two months and lives in a way that's absolutely insane? Isaiah is seeing the world from God's perspective in that word. I love that. Um, There's an old Navy commercial running uh, this Christmas season that I've just grown to hate with a passion. Uh, Thomas has nodded his head. It's what? The sorry not. It's the worst 15 second commercial in the history of 15 second uh, commercials. It's just awful. And the more I reflect on it, the more I hate it. Um, Jennifer Coolidge is in the commercial. I don't know if you know Jennifer Coolidge, but she tells us that she's hashtag sorry not sorry. And, and she literally sings this. When you, the first time I heard the lyrics, I was like, did she really just say what I thought she said? So the lyrics are this, tis the season for hashtag giving. Giving is the best. And then the kicker, blah, blah, blah. That's literally all the context that you get in the commercial for those 15 seconds. Now, this is what I love even more. I thought that I was the only one who hated this commercial, and then I looked it up on YouTube. I looked it up on YouTube, and I found the reactions to this, to this video, and, I, and, I, and then I, I, I discovered to my glee that we haven't all gone insane yet. We haven't all gone insane. So the reactions to this video include the following. First reaction, I will seriously never spend money at, Old Navy, at, the, at, at any Old Navy store again after seeing this ad over and over on Hulu. Great job, marketing team. I love that one. Uh, the second one, I actively took time out of my busy day to seek out this ad just to say how much I wish that it never existed. <laughs> I love that one. And this one's my favorite. The last one's my favorite. Exec one, are you sure this ad will help us to sell more clothes? Exec two close? (laughs) I thought that was great. So here's our yearly reminder with Isaiah as he looks into the latter days, as he sees what God is doing in the world. Here is our yearly reminder that the way our culture lives during this time of the year is absolutely, utterly insane. And I want you to know, friends, in the church's wisdom, Advent is the antidote. Embrace it. If you're new to it, listen, I'm telling you, it's going to bless you. It's the antidote to the craziness that uh, just overtakes our, our culture at this time of year. Advent, if I can say it like this, is the time when we are invited to get clear again. To get clear again. To see history. To see our small lives 
from the perspective of God's angle, to declutter our vision, to, yes, repent, and live faithfully in the light of King Jesus soon coming. Amen? To see beyond what I'll call the very low horizon of our culture, and it seems to be getting lower every year. Unlike Isaiah, we have the privilege of living on the other side of Christ's first coming. He didn't see that. But he faithfully proclaimed it. He believed it because he was shown it by our Lord. So that's the first thing, those latter days and seeing beyond the horizon with Isaiah. Then the second thing, if you look at verses 2-3, to the end of verse 2 into 3, is the magnetism and the height of God's house. The magnetism and the height of God's house. Let me read from verse, the end of verse 2 again. The nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Looking at the end of verse 2, again, Isaiah saw a time when people will be magnetically drawn to God's house, to God's dwelling place. And now here, he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but it has to go way beyond just one physical location. Because at the end of verse 2, he says, all nations shall flow to it. And that means that people everywhere will be able to what? Reach it. They'll be able to reach God's house. And they will not climb, I love this, but they'll be carried upstream. They're they're in a river that runs in reverse. From the bottom to the top, rivers don't flow upward as far as I know. And so this river, this river carries people up to the highest point, to the very dwelling place of God. The river of the Holy Spirit, as we know, loves to carry sinners up to the house of God through Jesus Christ. Amen? This is happening in our world today. Isaiah saw, for, uh, foresaw Pentecost. He saw the coming of Christ's church. He saw the day when people from every nation, every language, every tribe would be drawn to Jesus like metal to a magnet. Jesus Himself said this would happen, didn't He? He said in John 12.32, what? When I am lifted up, I will draw all peoples to Myself. Ironically, it's the humiliation of God in the cross of Jesus Christ that results in His supreme exaltation in all the earth. The magnetism of God's house. Wonderful. But then also the height. You can't have the magnetism without the height. And this is also ironic because physically, you may know, if you've been to Israel, you know this better than I do, actually, the mountain on that the Temple Mount sits on is actually more of like a hill. It's actually not that big of a, big of a mountain. It's like 2,400 feet high. Actually, the Mount of Olives, Olives in Jerusalem is actually higher than the Temple Mount. The Mount of Olives sits at 2,700 feet, and the Temple Mount sits at 2,400 feet. So the Lord chose to make His name known in, in a place that isn't even really the highest mountain, and that kind of fits our God doesn't it? He doesn't need the best mountain to proclaim His name. He doesn't need the the highest mountain for His name to be the most exalted. So Isaiah sees a time when the nations will choose, listen, this is important, not syncretism and not pluralism, but when they will forsake their ways, their false gods, for the God of Israel. And that's how it continues to happen today. Not through syncretism, not through pluralism, not through blessing false religion, but in forsaking it. Amen? Isaiah sees a time when the nations will willingly lay down their idolatry. When they'll lay down their bondage to sin and their false gods for the worship of the true and living God. This is, again, this is Isaiah's audacious claim in the Lord. If you were to look around in in Isaiah's day, there wouldn't have been a thing that would have told you that this is going to happen. That this is going to be a reality one day. And yet, if you were to look today, I say it again and again, but we have the privilege of looking back on 2,000 years of mission and saying, you know what? It's happening. At least partially. Wonderful promise. 
Here's a picture, not of all paths lead to God, but of the power of the cross to make rebels willingly lay down their arms and become worshipers. As Christians, we're part of that reality too. In our worship, we get the privilege of calling others into knowing Jesus Christ and actually laying down their arms willingly and coming to the foot of the cross. This is part of the church's calling. I want to look at the Jerusalem Declaration real quick. Who's got that? I need a prayer book. Thanks. So page 792. I want you to see what we confess. What do we believe as a church? You know, the Jerusalem Declaration was this massive declaration for worldwide Anglicans that said, this is what we believe, we stand on it, and we stand together. I want you to look at point five. We, again, page 792, we gladly proclaim and submit to the unique and universal Lordship of Jesus Christ. Sounds like Isaiah 2 to me. The Son of God, humanity's only Savior from sin, judgment and hell, who lived the life we could not live and died the death that we deserve. By His atoning death and glorious resurrection, He secured the redemption of all who come to Him in repentance and faith. Listen, whether you're here for the first time or whether you're a veteran, I want you to know we really believe that. I want you to know we stake our lives on the Gospel and its power to convert and heal and reconcile sinners. We believe this. This is true. And Isaiah believed it. Verse 4 goes on. And what verse 4 makes clear is that this peace that's being established by God and shared by all nations involves all creation. This peace is known partially now under Jesus' blessing and in His Word and sacrament, but fully when He comes again to judge evil and those who refuse repentance, to set the world to rights, and to be acknowledged as the world's true King. I want to end on verse 5. I love how Isaiah ends this little uh, passage here. This little call. How does he end verse 5? It's a beautiful verse. What is his response? What is he looking for from the church, if I can put it that way? What does he say? O house of Jacob, those who know the God of Israel, what does he say? Come let us walk in the light of the Lord. What a beautiful refrain. What a beautiful call. The response that Isaiah is looking for from the church is simply to be faithful to God. Simply to be faithful to the revelation He's given you. Simply to be faithful to who He is. Listen, Advent calls us to remember that God has sovereignly placed you in this time to live faithfully in in light of His time. In light of the great day that's coming. In in light of His soon coming day. I'm reminded here of a very memorable moment from The Lord of the Rings. Do you remember in The Fellowship of the Ring when Frodo is told the history of the ring by Gandalf and what has to now happen? What does Frodo say and what does Gandalf say? Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. Gandalf says, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Love that passage. What the Lord desires of His church, and and what He desires of us, is that we would trust Him and walk in His light. Amen? That we would simply keep to the path. That we would keep our lamps lit. That we would light our Advent candles with Him in our homes, individually, wherever we are. You know what every Advent teaches us? Every Advent teaches us that God is so much more patient than we are. Doesn't it? Every Advent teaches us that the Lord is so much more patient than I am, than you are. How many of you in the last year, looking out on human society, looking out on the world, would have found so many reasons to say, you know what, that's it. Bring the curtain down. I've had enough. 
if we were God. But God says, no. More may come into my kingdom. More may, may come in and be found by Jesus. More may come into my house and be drawn to it and know me. God is more patient than we are. We remember that every, every Advent. I'm going to end with this. I think I already said that, but I'm still, I'm in a sub point, I promise. There's another side to this call to walk in the light that Isaiah gives us. And you know what it is? It's the possibility that we may actually walk in darkness. If Isaiah has to call the people of God to walk in the light, then it is possible that each of us right now might be walking in darkness. In fact, verse 6, if you go on and read what happens after, this passage makes clear that God's people actually are walking in darkness and need repentance. It says in verse 6, you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east. What a powerful phrase. They are full, in Isaiah's time, not of the Lord's light, but of Satan's darkness. We need to hear the call of St. Paul again this Advent. What does he say to us? Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. What a phrase. Put on the armor of light. He doesn't say to make peace with the darkness. He doesn't say to avoid that confrontation. He says to cast it off. And we need to hear the, the words of our Lord when He tells us not to sleep or slumber, but to what? To watch and wait. Now is the time. Advent is the space that the Lord gives us to get right on this, and to do that work. There are so many ways that you can keep a faithful Advent. I want to give you one. I want to give you one way that you can keep a, a, a faithful Advent. I just want to give you a prayer for Advent that you can take and pray. It's part of the Compline liturgy of the church, if you know this. The prayer before bedtime. And I want to challenge you to make it part of your everyday routine in Advent, whether that's just before you go to bed, or when you're around the table, as a family, however you use it. But the prayer is, is Simeon's great nunc dimittis. Lord, now you dismiss. Now you let depart. You know, Simeon was waiting for the Messiah, wasn't he? And he met Jesus in the temple at his presentation. And Simeon prayed this, this amazing prayer. And it certainly speaks to me of walking in that light. Here's what he said. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. To be a light to lighten the Gentiles and to be the glory of your people Israel. I want to challenge you to let this prayer go to work on you this Advent. Let it deepen your thankfulness for the light you have in Christ. Let it deepen your fellowship with Him as you learn to trust Him more this Advent. And let it draw out of you the shadows of death and sin which still remain. That Isaiah too may come to pass in you. That you would be part of those who are being drawn to the magnetism the height, the mountain, and the house of the Lord, there to dwell forever. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our faith.